Hello my friends, I'm author and publisher Mark David Welsh and welcome to Victober 2020. And if you're wondering what Victober is, it's that month of the year when booktubers all across the world read Victorian literature and post about it on social media. And I'm here today to give you my first Victober book review, which is combined with my cult cinema thread as the book in question has been filmed on multiple occasions. And if you're thinking that I must be a very fast reader to get my first review up here on the first of the month, well, I'm pretty quick, but I'm not that quick. I confess that although I finished this book today, I read some of it last month in Victember. And this is a book that has had quite the cultural impact. It introduced the noun Svengali to the English language, the phrase in the altogether, even if you don't hear that much anymore. It also named this short-brimmed hat and arguably gave the world its first two horror films. Yes, I'm going to be talking about Trilby by George Du Maurier. Trilby was first published in serial form in 1894 and came out as a book a year later. It was an immediate and massive hit. Perhaps it was because the Victorians were fascinated by the new novelty of mesmerism. Perhaps it was the exotic Parisian locale that appealed. But it was a smash in America too, where a New York caterer offered an ice cream in the shape of Trilby's foot, there was a boot called the Trilby, and a foot-shaped Trilby sausage went on sale in Philadelphia. Yes, in the book, Trilby has very, very pretty feet. So what do most people understand about this story today? Well, if they know of it and know it's based on a book, they probably expect the book to be called Svengali, but it's not. It's named after its heroine Trilby instead, and for a very good reason. Prospective readers might also expect the story to focus on the sinister puppet master's hypnotic control over this young girl that he moulds into the greatest singer in the world. And that is in the book, yes, but it doesn't appear as a story element until the novel is about three quarters done. And then it's here and gone in about a few dozen pages. The remainder of the book is about the aftermath of those particular brief events. Now I'm going to put my card's face up on the table before I go any further. It's fair to say that I always try to accentuate the positive about anything that I review and respect the creative work and effort that goes into the artistic project concerned. However, that's going to be quite difficult here because I really did not like this book. I did not like it at all. I found it immensely tedious, frustrating and rather annoying. So let's start with the main story. If it's not about Sven Gali and his strange mind control of Trilby, then what is it about? Very good question. Well, our main protagonists are a trio of young British artists living as impoverished painters in Paris in the first half of the 19th century. There's the practical and capable Taffy, the over-emotional and highly strung little Billy, and their friend, the Laird of Cockpen. Now, obviously, these are nicknames, but they are the names used throughout almost the entirety of the book. They meet Trilby when she's posing for a sculptor in one of the apartments above their studio, and it's love at first sight for little Billy and Taffy, although Trilby only has eyes for the babyish little Billy. The Laird of Cockpen doesn't seem all that fussed, but I honestly don't know what he's doing in the book in the first place. Anyway, Billy pesters Trilby to marry him, but she keeps refusing because she's an artist model, not a proper profession for a young lady, and has possibly an even more dubious past, which is hinted at but never closely examined. Eventually, in a moment of weakness, she accepts his proposal, and he writes home with the happy news. This prompts a visit from his scandalised mother and his clergyman uncle, and they persuade Trilby to give him up. She runs off and Billy has a nervous breakdown and is taken back to England. Five years later he's recovered, in the meantime becoming a very famous artist. Then he reunites with his old friends Taffy and the Laird of Cockpen for a Parisian holiday. And that takes us up to the point where the most famous part of the tale kicks in. About 70,000 words in. 
Yes, Svengali does appear in the early part of the book, but no more than a couple of times and then only briefly. In the entire story, he only interacts with the main protagonists on three or four occasions, and only one of these brief interactions is at all significant. And that brings us on to another problem. The story's narrator is someone who was in Paris when the events in question took place and has pieced the story together afterwards by speaking to the principals. So while there are some dialogue scenes where the protagonists are present on the page, mostly it's all second-hand information related by this unidentified speaker who never takes an active role in the story. Of course, this creates an immediate barrier between the events of the narrative and the reader. Show, not tell, as they say in the movies. And this narration is pretty exasperating as well. I mean, do you want to know which cafe our three friends visited for dinner one night? Of course you do. Of, do you want to know what street the cafe was on? What they ate? How much it cost? Do you want to know where they ate three nights later? Well, strangely enough, after a while I really didn't. And I also wasn't remotely interested in the lives of their circle of friends because they have no bearing on what little plot there is and their presence seems entirely for the purpose of padding out the book. Du Maurier was born in Paris to an English mother and a French father and obviously knew the city intimately. But for me, just naming cafes, streets and other buildings doesn't really convey the atmosphere of a place and bring it to life. It's just a dull regurgitation of facts. Sure, sprinkle some information through the text lightly here and there and it can provide local colour, but this is the equivalent of being bashed over the head repeatedly with a Parisian guidebook. Also, the prose often left me feeling like I was being screamed at by an over-enthusiastic teenager. Line after line of the text finishes with an exclamation mark. I have never read a book that features so many. I can't help worrying that Du Maurier may have broken that particular key on his typewriter by the time he'd finished writing it. The characters of Trilby and Svengali are also points of contention with me. The former is romanticised to a ridiculous extent, becoming almost a sainted Madonna by the story's close. Although this concept of the self-sacrificing innocent was a very popular one with a Victorian public. Svengali, I'm sorry to say, is described as shabby and dirty and has a beard of burnt up black which grew almost from under his eyelids. Although his identification as Jewish has tended to disappear from the character over the years, it's right here front and centre in the original work and it's depressing to find Du Maurier indulging in such narrow-minded anti-Semitism. The book was quickly adapted for the stage and became a big hit all over again. And this is where the hat comes in. Because the actress playing Trilby typically wore a short-brimmed soft felt hat. And as a result, that style became known as the Trilby. We also have to give Du Maurier credit for the word Svengali, because as far as I can tell, it doesn't seem to have existed prior to his book. In terms of its impact on cinema, as I said at the beginning of this video, it arguably gave the world its first two horror films. In 1895, the pioneering Thomas Edison Film Company shot footage of the popular stage production by the David Henderson Burlesque Company. And if you're thinking that sounds a little odd, it is worth noting that Henderson was responsible for building the Chicago Opera House a couple of years later. So it's probably fair to assume that Burlesque had a slightly different social standing back then. Now the films that the Edison Company shot were each less than a minute long, but it has been argued that two of them qualify as horror films. One featured what was almost certainly the first ever death scene filmed, and the other had Trilby falling under Svengali's hypnotic spell. Now sadly these films are of course lost, along with all but one of the other multiple silent versions. Now of the sound versions, I would recommend the 1931 John Barrymore film Svengali, which also starred an effervescent Marion Marsh as Trilby who is such a bundle of joy it's a surprise she doesn't float up to the ceiling in every scene. 
Not only are these two both outstanding in their roles, but the sets and cinematography evoke German Expressionist cinema of the 1920s, although not so extreme. But screenwriter J. Grubb Alexander has done about the best adaptation of book to screen possible in the circumstances. He switches the focus to the Svengali-Trilby relationship almost exclusively, sidelining the painters, while remaining pretty faithful to the main events of the novel. There's some genuinely unsettling moments, courtesy of Barrymore, and the contact lenses that he wore, the first pair ever used in the movies. And boy, they make his eyes look weird at times. The film was such a hit that Barrymore and Marsh did it all over again in The Mad Genius later the same year, which also featured a pre-stardom Boris Karloff. The 1954 British version doesn't hold up nearly so well. Writer-director Noel Langley chose to try and adapt the entire novel, so we only get Sven Gali's mesmerism of Trilby in the last 25 minutes. Up until then, we get a drippy romance between Hildegard Neff as Trilby and Terence Morgan as Billy. And yes, Neff was a German actress with a heavy German accent, but the character is still supposed to be Irish. Everyone else in the entire cast is frightfully, frightfully British, with not a French accent to be heard anywhere. Neff was also 29 at the time, probably because it was felt that a British audience of the 1950s would not accept an intimate relationship between a teenage character and a middle-aged man. Unfortunately, this means that our three young painters are all in their mid-30s here. And all this would be okay if the parts had been rewritten age-appropriate, but they weren't. And in particular, Terence Morgan's Billy comes over as an impossibly petulant and immature little child for his age, which means the audience isn't rooting for him and has no idea what Neff sees in him. The good news is that Svengali is played by famous British stage actor Donald Wolfitt, who chews the scenery a little bit at times, but is undeniably strange and creepy at others. I found it a little hard to work out whether he was giving a really good performance or a really bad one but it did earn him a BAFTA nomination. There was also a 1980s TV movie version with Peter O'Toole and a young Jodie Foster. Yes, that's a real movie, and no, I really wouldn't if I were you. To summarise, I didn't enjoy this reading experience at all, and would caution anyone else who might be tempted to try it. I have read a lot of Victorian fiction over the years, and I really can't recall another example that I enjoyed less. Next up is the penny dreadful Wagner the Werewolf by G.W.M. Reynolds from 1847. Well, that's it for this week. Please leave a like or share and subscribe if you've enjoyed the video. And I'll see you over the next few weeks when I'll be posting more about my Victober experiences. But in the meantime, stay safe, stay well and don't be a stranger.